There. So welcome to our Nature Journal Club workshop. This is going to be uh, our advanced workshop on drawing birds. If you missed last month's workshop, you can still get a lot of stuff out of this workshop without having seen that other one. But what we're going to be doing in this class is really going down the rabbit hole of analyzing all these really anal retentive, fussy details about birds that can show up in your pictures. And um, so if you start with this, you might think that drawing birds is all about kind of noodling in, like what are the feathers between the beak and the eye and these sorts of things. And that initial focus, I think, can be, is, is, can, can be distracting. So if you haven't seen it, I'm going to encourage people to see the video that I did of, the la of last month's workshop where we were kind of blocking in the shape of the bird and sort of figuring out how with a few lines to kind of get this form that kind of feels like the bird and how to place a few details <laughs> on that. So if you can look at a bird and quickly get the gestalt of it down on paper, um, the thing with them birds, they're going to fly away, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Or at least they're going to move. So it turns out that really understanding details of their anatomy is incredibly helpful in allowing you to then, you know, how can I fill out the rest of this picture? Or if the bird's moving around so you can still see, yeah, it's got white undertail coverts, but it's in a different position, you can then take what you're seeing and interpolate it into the sketch that you're doing. Right? So what I normally do on a page is as the bird is moving around, is I'll start with with several different poses of this bird as it's moving around, and then I'll be jumping around between these, or maybe I've got over here, just sort of a detail of the side of its face, and so I'll be bouncing around between these different sketches, and the sketch that I get the furthest along on will be the most characteristic posture of the bird. Um, but still, even doing that, um, the bird's eventually going to fly away, and also it really helps to have a foundation in the anatomy of these things so that when you're looking at the bird you know what to look at and you understand what's there. You will see in this class that um, after, we're going to start just by looking at the details of the anatomy of the head and then you'll look at a picture and you'll discover that how I look at a bird has just fundamentally changed. You'll notice details that you otherwise wouldn't notice. Uh, uh, noticed. You'll see things that you otherwise would not have seen. And you need to be able to notice and see those things before you can draw it. If you can see it, you can draw it. But if you can't even really, it's got, got a blotchy head, you, there's no way you're going to transfer that to paper. Um, and the nice thing about getting this structure is you don't need to memorize a bunch of different structures for each little bird that's out there. There are these really common patterns that you'll see across all the different birds. And so what you do, once, once that's under your belt, you can take, you, you learned it on the gross beak over here, now there's a warbler in front of you, you see those similarities and differences, it really helps you, you've got this one kind of scaffolding that is your understanding of how the anatomy of these things are put together. So that's where we're going to be going, I've got to warn you, this is, I'm going to get fussy with a whole bunch of details, right? Um, but just sort of keep it in context. Um, this is in the context of kind of you've got the oomph of this thing on paper and now you want to be able to flesh out these other parts of the birds. And there's some, just some key points. We're going to look really carefully at heads, we're going to look really carefully at wings and also at feet. And so these are three places that if you get those, it turns out like the belly of the bird, there are some tricks in there but it's not as confusing for people as the head, the feet and the wings. So that's where we're going to spend our quality time today. And I'm going to start by um, drawing three <coughs> bird heads here. And this one on this side is going to be looking towards you. The one in the middle is going to be at a three-quarter view angle. And the one over on this side is going to be looking in that direction. So we're going to simultaneously be working on these three heads. Boop, boop, boop. And then um, fleshing those out looking at the patterns of feathers on them and on sort of a generic bird. And um, so here we go. I'm going to encourage people in your notes or if you're following along on the video at home to, to follow along and don't just watch but actually try to recreate these things in your notes. The process of doing that will make what you observe stick much better. You can actually do that watching any video if you're actually, if you're actively taking notes while you're watching something. Don't think that like, oh, that's how you do it. That's going to stick in my head. It's not going to stick in your head as well as if you're kind of following along. 
you also then have some notes that you can refer back to. Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, if you look at uh, Mark's sketch notes um, uh, all that we post on the Nature Journal Club, um, he's using both writing and drawing to record the things that he really wants to stick in his head. Um, he's just offered to give us, by the way, a workshop on sketch noting. Right? So we're going to get his perspective on that and that's going to be really fun. But I'm going to already encourage people to start doing the same thing in your own notes. It doesn't have to look pretty, just the process of doing it will help you learn better. So I'm going to encourage everybody to start off three circles. And here's the, the, the front one. What I often will do is I will start a drawing uh, like this. I imagine that there are crosshairs across the face of the bird. So there is a line that comes down through the middle of the bird's head. Right? And that line, depending on how the bird is moving its head this way, that sort of central axis is going to turn. That's really going to help you keep a a sense of you know what is on what side. It's also useful to imagine a line going through the middle of the bird. Right? Well, I'll, I'll wash it off when I get home. But if I pick up my daughters like this, they think yeah. it's really funny. So, um, so, so as the bird is doing this, that you're seeing the arc of the, the eye line kind of turn up and down, yeah. and this. All right, so those are what, what essentially what I've got going here is these crosshairs. Let me turn this light off. There we go. It'll be a little bit easier to see. All right, so I've got these crosshairs through it. And as the bird is turning its head in these different positions, it can be looking up, looking down, looking to the side and straight, side up, side down, or side down, side up. On the side view one, you don't see this line because it's on the side of the circle. So I'm going to actually take this center line, the eye line, and extend it out in front of the beak because on a lot of birds, you're going to find on these songbirds, that beak is going to line up with the eye. So it's this eye beak line that is very, very useful. So you get here for these two, I do the crosshairs for this one, I'm going to put in this eye beak line. And let's take a look at the shape of the beak initially from the front. Um, if I, here's a little bird beak, and notice that we have this little kind of house shape. Kind of comes up, flat bottom, up on the sides, little pointed roof. All right, there's my bird house. Mm -hmm. This works a little bit better. Yeah, so there's the bird house. Now, for a smaller bird's beak, you're going to just have a smaller beak. But we'll often generally have the same shape, sometimes not quite as pointed towards the front. And we get to drawing a really small bird kind of distant from you. The base of that bird, you could, you're basically getting drawn a little tiny box. You don't, it's going to be so small you can't even really do that. But that's the shape we'll expect to see from the front. And the reason which we're kind of figuring out what that shape is, is that the bird's beak is going to insert into the head at the junction of these crosshairs, like that. So I'm going to draw the little birdhouse on those. This one a little bit squished side to side because it's foreshortened. So that's where my beak is going to come out of the head. And I can't see that space here because it's the side view again. On the side view, though, I'm going to draw the upper bill and the lower bill, the edges of those. Different species are going to have different shapes, different lengths of bills, and different steepnesses of bills. Very often on a big, heavy seed-eating bill, it's going to be very broad, because you don't want to snap a delicate bill trying to crunch a seed, so it'll have a beefier, chunkier, often shorter bill. Um, and this is going to be a gross beak style bill that I'm going to be drawing here. So this is going to be a very beefy bill in this demonstration. <clears throat> and then if I want to get that, let's uh, take a close look at that, that bill shape here. Um, notice a couple of things. First of all, it's wide top to bottom. And this bill has, the suture of its mouth, has a little bend in it. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that in the back? Right? So that 
the, you'll get this kind of nutcracker bend mm -hmm. in bills that are where, there's, where you're going to want a little bit more bite force. So you'll see this very strongly in grosbeaks, you'll see this in finches, you'll see this in blackbirds, um, a number of different species. Not all species of birds will have that corner in them, but you start looking for it, you'll see that especially with often, very often with big, uh, bigger, chunkier belts. So here it is, a more close view of that. See that? Another feature, I've got a little nostril in the upper part of the bill. There's that little uh, kind of bend down in the mouth. Notice you don't really see that here in this straighter bell. Uh, another thing that uh, we want to notice here is how, does, how do the feathers of the bell attach to the head? Um, people will often draw a bird beak this way. Here's my bird head, and from the side, here's my bird beak. And it kind of looks like a carrot stuck into a snowman. Um, but let's look at what's going on here. Notice that if the head is here, there's beak that is going into the head, and there are feathers of the head that are going into the beak. So on the upper bill, I've got a wedge of feathers that points towards the nostril. And then there's a little slight arc of feathers in this lower bill. Notice that this point does not have to be even with this one. Sometimes you'll see some, this, this sort of an effect like this, kind of bump, bump. But very often this lower bill is going to be back further. The last thing to notice, so I've got this, this. People will often draw the bird's head feathers coming down from this point. So here is the edge of my bird's head. But notice how far out underneath this bill this bird's throat actually is. So the chin feathers, the throat and, and chin feathers come out underneath that bill. Here it is again, this time very low nostril. Notice V into the nostril, this arc coming in pretty far on the head, and look at how far out those chin feathers come. So that's how our beak is going to attach into our head. Once we kind of get um, a little bit more detail, here's a little frown line down from my mouth. I'm going to have feathers that will pooch into it on the top and, and on the bottom. And I have not, I'm putting in my chin feathers yet, but when I do, they will be out here, not coming down from this bottom corner of the beak. Let's take a look at how this angle in the beak looks if you look at the bird from the front. See that? It's this M shape, up, down, up, down. So M for mouth here. Um, so on this bill over here, here's my M. If the bird doesn't have this corner, it's going to be a straight line across. Or sometimes if it bends down, you'll have something that looks like this. It can look like that. It can be straight across. But if there's that angle, you will get that M from the front. The last thing I'm going to do is put in my beak shape on this three-quarter view angle. The problem that people have with uh, drawing in the, the beak, there are two things. One is, people will see how long the beak is in this view and draw the beak the same length over here. The problem with that is that this is going to be a foreshortened beak. So it's not going to be the full length that you would see if you're drawing this from the side. So foreshortening really takes some brain gymnastics. Your brain doesn't, your brain goes like, oh, Robin's got this long straight beak. I gotta draw this long straight beak. Where you're drawing a starling with a long beak, but you're drawing it at a three quarter view angle, it really is tough to force yourself to draw that beak shorter than you know it is. Yeah. Right? So put yourself in that position, just want to know like, okay, three quarter view, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna draw the beak shorter. Um, the other problem is, is that where does the tip of it go? Here's my beak. Really? Or is it here? Really? Mm. 
or is it right here? Or is it here? Right? Where along here is that tip of the beak going to go? So I've drawn a lot of birds with the head one way and then the beak just a little bit. Right? But I figured out a way to avoid that problem. And what it is, is that this is my arc of the circle across the face, these cross hairs. Don't think of these as a T in the front. Think of it as a line that's going to go all the way around the sphere. So I'm going to visualize, I don't have to draw this in, but I'm going to visualize those lines as going as, as an oval, going all the way up the front and down the back, across the front and around the back. Those two lines are going to intersect in two places, one in the front and one in the back. So if I visualize then a line going through those, the, beak, the tip of the beak is going to be somewhere on that line. So I can then take this distance, bring it over to here, from the base of the cross section to there, and it's going to be something shorter than that. So I take that point and then go someplace shorter than that. The more it's turned towards you, the shorter it will be until you get to this view. Which also means you've got a lot of wiggle room, but, but you just don't want to make it the full length. So then to that point, I'm going to draw a line from the top of this bill to that point, and from that point to this back corner of the bill. And then I would erase this inner line and draw the rest of the bill on there. So I should get in there and I'm eventually going to get in here and erase some of this. But take a look at how the tip of the beak relates to the top and this bottom point. Mm -hmm. Alright? So you're not drawing that line to this corner, but the bottom of this bird's bill is going to be coming up from there. So there's going to be the bottom surface of this bill coming up like that. But wait, there's more. Um, so the bill shape, depending on, on whether you've got skinny bill, big, gross beak bill, littler finch bill, you'll get this, uh, you'll, 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 you'll treat it the same way. If you draw the birdhouse shape lightly, then you don't even have to get in there and erase that line. Once you draw your heavier beak over it, people eyes will go straight to that. One other little trick here with this bird beak is that your brain knows that there is a line that comes between the top and the bottom like that. Right? So we tend to draw in what we know should be there. But let's just back up a second here. Not you. There. Oh, yes, you. Right? Notice that very often you'll see that that suture down the mouth, towards the tip, it becomes a little bit less visible. So very often you'll see it strong back here. So I find it actually looks better if I just kind of come here and then suggest that out like that and let the viewer fill in that part. It looks a little bit less cartoony. So I'm, I'm doing that with a lot of my bird mouths now and I'm liking them better. So now, let's put the head shape around these things. We're going to refine this. One of the problems of starting a drawing with a circle is we tend then to over-round the bird's head. So people will then follow that circle. The use, utility of a circle kind of blocking that in for the head is initially in the start of a sketch, you want some, something that you can draw quickly and easily that you can use just to make sure you made your head the right size. So when I'm starting off on a drawing, I, the reason I use a circle for the head is if my body's here, I'll put it in my head and go like, oops, that's too big. It's easy for, no, it's too small. Okay, yeah, okay, there we go, that's what I want. And but then it, it's easy to then start following the shapes of these circles and you get this kind of frosty the snowman bird 
It looks like you two took, took two circles and put them together because you took two circles and you put them together. So we have to <coughs> avoid that Frosty the Snowman effect by kind of looking at what are the real shapes and the angles around this thing. So from the front, you're going to see a narrower part on the upper part of the head and below the eyes, below the center of the line, you're going to go out at a wider angle. So the whole thing kind of has this kind of Apollo moon landing command module look, right? So in here and then wider out to the cheeks. So I'm going to put that um, on my birdie. So here, narrower here, and then widening out at the cheeks a little bit. Notice that in the side view and the three-quarter view, they have a flatter front. And you see a little bit of this bump on the back, a lot of it here. We will look at what causes this, but this is actually a place where there's a really interesting kind of subtle angle change at the back of the bird's head. We'll learn why in a moment, but for now, just for these sketches, um, I'll get you guys to include that in. And I've now got my, my bird head shape, and I'm going to place my eye on it. The trick with the eyes on songbirds is the eye is probably going to go closer to the front of the bird than you think it should be. A lot of people will put the eye right here in the center and also tend to make the eye too big. Right? Um, so the eye is going to be closer to the front. This distance right here between beak and eye is really useful. So that distance is not going to change as the bird is fluffing its feathers around. The distance to the back of the head can change, the difference to the top. It's still useful to look at those distances there, but you look at the bird one moment and then you look back, you know, you go, does that, that what's that? This distance won't change. The eye is not going to move relative to the base of the beak. Still, it's nice to get these, especially if you're working from a photograph, but on a live bird, these distances will change as it's sort of moving around. So be ready for that. As the head turns towards you, the round eye is be going to become more of an ellipse. Or you may see this shape here with a sort of angry bird eye. Mm. Right? So it could be more elliptical, or sometimes you have a little bit of angle on the inside side. So now to get rid of this little orphan Annie effect, we're going to fill in the eye. I'm going to show you kind of in a generic bird eye application uh, that I do, and then think about how I will modify that for different lighting conditions. My generic bird eye is three circles. I have an outer circle, an outer circle. That outer circle is the outside edge of the eye. There is a lightly drawn off-center circle here. That's going to be the highlight on the surface of the eye. And tucked underneath that is the pupil. And the pupil is going to be symmetrical in the middle of the eye. Right. Some birds have a colored, light-colored iris and then a dark pupil. On other birds, there's a dark iris, so the eye is all dark, in which case it would just be two circles. But if there's a light-colored iris, three circles, the reason I draw that one, uh, that highlight, with a very light line, is that when I go then to put shading in that eye to give some value to the iris and the pupil, I, want, I don't want that to have a hard line around it. So if I put, I put, if I put a hard line around there, that would, ooh, it would look like, well, there's a highlight. Is that a highlight? I don't know. It's got a little ring around it. I don't want that. So I do that lightly with my pencil, and then that's all going to blend in. So that's what I'm doing here. It's just a really quick application of or sometimes I don't even draw the circle around the highlight. I know that I'm going to get it there. I make that pupil a little cup shape and then kind of work my way around that. If it's kind of a foggy day, I'm not going to have a bright, crisp highlight. I'm going to have more of a diffuse highlight. Or if the bird is way deep down in the, the canopy of the rainforest, there's not a, light, a lot of light getting down there. If you take a look at a photograph of, a bird, say, an ant pitta from underneath the forest, it is going to have a bright, crisp highlight in its eye. Why is that? It's the flash bulb. Right? There's so little light down there, you need that flash bulb. 
right? And then there's a highlight in the eye. Sometimes in the very center of the eye. So don't put your highlight in the center. That's drawing a bird that's looking at a flashbulb, right? Um, actually, in some, some uh, um, take a look at some, uh, it's fun to do this with owl photographs because photograph, photographers get it really close and go poof, right? And with a captive owl. And um, you can see the shape of the actual flash bulb in the eye. Sometimes like, oh, you're using a ring flash, right? It's like right there in the eye. Um, so, um, or sometimes you don't have a highlight at all. If it's in shape, you might just have a lighter part at the top or it's on the sh shadow side of the bird's head, there may not be a highlight up there. Highlights help the eye look wet. So they do, uh, they kind of do help your, your drawing look good, but um, just pay attention, like, is this a condition that where there's a reflection off something? You know, if I have a little uh, a wet grape here, would there be a crisp highlight on that? In some lighting conditions, yes. In some lighting conditions, no. Now I'm gonna put feathers around this eye and fill out the face. Birds don't just have feathers randomly over their entire head, they have specific tracts of feathers. Little zones where the feathers come up, and then there are blank spots between them, and the feathers can fluff out from those places where the feathers grow out over those areas. So you'll see very crisp patterns, similar patterns of how the feathers come out of the heads across a whole bunch of different birds. Um, in a basic class, I teach three feather tracks. I teach, there's a ring of feathers that goes around the eye, there's one that goes over the ear, and there's one that kind of this, on the sides of the chin, the mallard. I teach those three, and that gives people a really good foundation. In this workshop, we're going to go a little bit further. We're going to learn some other feather tracks of the head. If you're doing those three, you're pretty close to getting most of the feather tracks on the head. So why not just do a little bit more work? Put in the work to understand those feather tracks of the head. It'll be a little bit of work up front, but then every time you're looking at a bird head or sketching a bird head, you understand the architecture of what's down there. And if the bird has an old dark head, these feather tracks can still show up as little bumps and ripples that catch light. Or if there are patterns on the bird's head, the patterns on the bird's head are going to go along the edges of these zones. Right? So either way, these are real gold. It's going to start with this patch of feathers that goes around the bird's eye. There's a little tight ring, and then there's a zone of a little bit broader feathers around the eye that are often easier to see on the underside of the eye. It kind of makes the bird look like they're a little bit sleepy. This part here also sometimes even makes a white patch on the, the side of the head of a bird. Often, even if the ear patch is a little dark, those would be just a little bit lighter. So there's a ring around the eye, and then think of those as kind of extra sort of bags under the eyes. The next zone is going to connect the eye and the beak. In this space between these two, there's a zone of little tight, short feathers kind of bristly feathers, not very fluffy, little tiny feathers in here. They've got a different texture than everything else. So even when the rest of the head is all the same color, because of that different texture, it'll catch light differently. Sometimes it looks darker, sometimes it looks lighter. And it is, it's called the lores, L-O-R-E-S. So that's coming in, sort of mid-eye here, and going to the beak. It's this little zone here. You're going to see in a, some photographs in a moment that you're going to see this little spot as just, it looks different than the rest of the bird. In fact, there's just a little smudge right in that area. Um, so on this bird, very clear, dark lores. Right? This one, not as clear, but if you're looking for it, you can see it. Right? So there's little, sort of this pale area right in there. So that's our lures. Um, and then we're going to go a little bit further than that, because very often above the lures, there will be a, there's an area right above that that often is a little bit brighter and lighter. It's, the name of this area translates to the zone above the lures. It's the supralaural patch. Right? So the supralaural patch is above the laurel patch. The lures are here, the supralaural is up here. Um, so there's 
And it kind of also kind of helps with this angry bird's look from the front. All right, so from the front, kind of coming in, and then arcing up over the eye. So here's a bird with a zone of white feathers around its eye, and also the super laurel patch on this is white, gives it this kind of glasses look, sort of wearing spectacles. Um, so here with this eye ring, uh, if, if the ring of feathers around the eye, if that is brightly colored, we call it an eye ring. If not, it's just the ocular ring. So the ocular ring just refers to the texture of these feathers around there. Sometimes those get colored a different color. And if they've also got a color that makes them go like, look at me, right? then that's, the, that's an eye ring. So here we have an eye ring and the super laurel patch here has this white in it. The lores here are, are darker than the rest of the head. So just as there are special eyes around the eye, there are also special um, um, feathers and, and, uh, that go around the bird's ear. So the bird has an ear patch. And let's look at the shape of this ear patch. It's going to come back from the eye. It's going to arc around the side of the head. It's going to come down from the corner of the mouth here. And then sometimes you'll see this little kind of swoop out here. This little swoop. Um, I call this the, the Sibley swoop because I, the first time I saw this little sort of change in angle, I was looking at drawings by David Allen Sibley. And I was like, like, that's weird. I was drawing all my ear patches as these triangles. Right? And, but Sibley had this, like, this little angle, like, what's up with that? I'm like, birds don't have that. And then I started looking at birds and it's like, oh, yes, they do. <laughs> um, not, not, you don't always see it, but you, you'll often, you start looking for the Sibley swoop. And, and you'll see that on a number of, of, of ear patches. The feathers in these ear patches follow this, these kind of arc of the sort of eye ring. So any texture you see in here is going to be arcing underneath that. And then on the back side of it, there's a zone of sort of longer feathers that go over a big bare patch of skin. So when we're bird banding um, on our next field trip, you can even you can get somebody to lift that up, and you can see bare skin under there. There's a hole in the side of the bird's head. And so that comes to a little edge right there. Um, here's a bird. Head is all the same color. Look at that ear patch. So this will, can really help you kind of get the architecture of this bird's head. Yeah. You know, is that just a random wrinkle because the wind blew it weird, or is that something structural? You can tell. Also, if you look really carefully, you can see the ocular ring, the ring around the eye. Um, <clears throat> now, let's add in one more zone. This is actually two for the price of one. You add in, uh, you can either think of this as adding in the throat or adding in the malar. Because when you do one, you get the other. So this is two for the price of one. So if from the corner, let's look at this one here. From the corner of the beak here, I come down straight like that and block off a little square here. That gives you this chin and throat area. But it also separates the ear patch by this little bar on the sides. So two for the price of one. So you put in the little chin area here. You also get the malar above it. I'm going to just, but be sure you think of this malar as its own sort of separate unit right here. So this region right here is called the malar. This is the chin and throat. Um, if the bird's head is all one color, you will often see at the edge, or at this point, kind of a little shadow line coming down here, and then it kind of peters out and gets a little bit more faint. Um, you will sometimes see different texture feathers here, or different color feathers here in the malar. And um, on the top of the head, there are also uh, there can be stripes, or the whole crown of the head up here can be a single color. If you've got your super laurel going on here, 
you're, you've got the guide then to lock in a whole, to, to separate the crown from everything below. So you could just follow this up and then arc it down here. All right, that zone can be solid color or it also can be striped. And when it's striped, what you get is just a single skunk stripe up the middle of it. So it makes two bars on the top of the head. So a skunk stripe, you then have this super laurel, starting with the super laurel here and going across in this line above the eye. But if you are seeing it from the front, you're going to have two bars on, on either side. The names for these zones and the names for the stripes get confusing because there are two different systems of terms. One, for instance, the ocular feathers here, um, <coughs> this ocular ring, that refers to the feathers that stick, always sort of stick up in this place in their texture. If they happen to be colored white, then that is referred to as an eye ring. So there's one set of terms for the patterns made by the colors. There's another set of terms made for the patterns made by the, the, where the feathers come out. And this has caused a lot of confusion. Um, the person who I think has the best analysis of it is David Sibley. Um, and a book that I'm going to recommend that everybody get is his book, Birding Basics. It's a little book, lots of pictures, easy read, amazing little book. Dr uh, studying his book about, it's all about, got tons of stuff on bird anatomy. Studying that book radically improved my bird drawings. Great little book. And you see the Sibley swoop on some of his, 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 his sketches there. And so we, what he points out is that, you know, people will, he, he wants clear terms that distinguish this is the malar, this zone here. Um, but if you look at the head of a bird with stripes on it, right, you, whoa, what's going on here? Um, this stripe here, right, you say, oh, that must be the malar. Well, if that's the malar, what's this? Right? So what's going on here is that with the patterns, you're either going to take a zone and turn it into a color, right? Or you're going to go on the edge of a zone and darken that in. So a whole malar can be a color, or the boundary between them can get color on it. Um, and then that needs a different term than the malar. So I can have like a sort of a, a, a whisker line here. Um, what does he call them? Do you call those whisker lines? I know. I think so. I should look it up if I'm doing lectures like this. But um, the uh, but but check um, out his his analysis of it. I think is is the most useful. I really really like the way he does. It. Um, so take a look at this. So I've got malar coming in this way, my super laurel coming in this way. I've got this crown stripe coming in here and my chin coming in here. That's what's giving you this asterisk face, right? So here's my ear patch. And the sleepy feathers are white. Here's my malar, here's the zone between the malar and the throat. Right, here's that whole crown. Here's that central crown stripe. So these patterns on the face, these zones that you're learning, really, it was like, how would you even begin to approach something like this? You could just sort of slavishly copy what you're seeing. But if you understand the structure, then you, and you also then can look across birds and it's like, oh, I'm seeing this again and again and again. Look at this lovely fawn-colored malar stripe in this. And notice again that the stripe in here is occurring at the boundary between the malar and the throat. And there's that sw Sibley swoop. 
right? Nice sleepy eye. A little bit darker on the edge of the ear patch and on the edge of the ear patch there. So take a look at this and just sort of analyze that bird's head and see if it makes sense to you. Are you noticing things about it that you otherwise would not have seen a few minutes ago? So no, just notice to yourself how having this foundation changes the way you look at a photograph or a bird. It changes the way you look at a bird. It will change the way you draw that bird. Right? That, this, this anatomy is so useful in getting that, 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 that head. Like this, look at this little, what's that? Is that a, is that a, line, yeah. a line between the mouth yeah, and the chin? Yes, yes. Right, gold star. <laughs> right? Whoa. I, I, I love this mallard. This is, this is, this is like the, the candy corn mallard, right? Is the black part of the mallard? So the... So let's, let's just, so remember the mallard goes from this corner here, down. The ear patch goes from this corner down. So here's my lowers, here's my super laurel, crown. Poofing out. This is the chin and the throat. You don't usually see a line separating those. On a lot of birds, it's all one color. But, uh, does that help? Mm -hmm. And also, I like to look at this, this, also this here, this, this swoop out here. <laughs> There's one more little piece of this puzzle. You see how the, the heads just make more sense now, right? Um, so the last little piece of this puzzle is going to take up all this real estate back here. And it's a triangular or, or a crescent bandana of feathers that go across the, the nape of the bird's neck called the nape, right? And that pad of feathers can, if that's what's going to make this bulge here. And I didn't have napes in my drawings for the longest time. And once I kind of got nape on my radar, I started seeing this, this, this little subtle thing that makes a big difference. Kind of how easy would it be just to take your pen and kind of go, that's the back of my head, right? But, you know, if you're getting napey, all right, you've got this little subtlety going on, right? Ooh. Mm -hmm. So along the edge of that ear patch, there's my nape. And they can really puff that thing out. Or here's a bird, its head is, oh, I'll check out that super laurel. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also, this is kind of fun. Look at the, so here the throat and the mallow are same color. Isn't that cool? But there's still a little bit, you're seeing a little bit of a hint of a shadow coming down right in there. Ooh. And you can see that transferring to here. See how that kind of comes in at a different height there? Let me erase those lines. Look at how, same color, but this little nape that gives you this extra bulge. So it's a subtle thing, but oh, it's good. It's good. Can I ask, what is the nape again? Can you so it, it is this patch of feathers right here behind the ear patch. Okay. And so on this guy, it's this gray brown zone right there. Why does it bulge like that? Um, so it can't, so um, as this bird stretches its neck up, you want some extra feathers in here so that your neck is still covered when your neck is up high. Um, 
And then when it comes down, so it's got to go somewhere and that kind of bulge out. So it really kind of helps as your bird is doing these sorts of things, kind of following that contour. But the more it comes down, then you get this little napy bulge. On birds where the head is really up, you're not going to see a napy bulge. But they've got nape. <laughs> all right. So you've got all these little patterns. Depending on how you get in there and you color them in, they are going to make one bird or another. All right. So, but <coughs> you're going to find that those patterns are they're, 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 they're these, they give you these boundary lines within which things are doing all this kind of neat stuff. So now what I want you to do is just take a look at the head of this bird. Realize that a few minutes ago, you would have looked at this and it would have just been like a bunch of blotchy lights and darks. Mm -hmm. And now you look at it, you're seeing it differently. That's really powerful. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. So all of you are going to get homework, right? And this is your first homework assignment, is that what I'd like you to do is to either from a side or a three-quarter view, make an anatomical feather tracked drawing of a bird's head. And you can use photo reference for this. I recommend that you do. So um, there are two websites that I, um, all the, the photos in this show come from two websites. Those are birdpixel.com and seeingbirds.com. Both of those websites are maintained by uh, members of the Nature Journal Club who are wonderful nature photographers. So Vivek Kanzori and Ashok Kasla are nature photographers and they've given us permission to use their, their, their photo sets to help us learn to draw, to celebrate birds. Some people get really kind of pushed out of shape if you, you know, like, you copied my photograph. These guys are like, no, no, please, come on in. Come on in, come on in, let's, let's please work with this. Really well organized, beautiful, professional photographs. And um, so I would go to that website, find a bird that, where you can sort of see some neat anatomy stuff, maybe even with a Sibley swoop, and then diagram that out and make a labeled drawing. You can also go to the front of any bird book or Sibley's Birding Basics and take a look there at, they'll have a chart, they'll have a diagram like this um, with the names of all these different parts. Um, I really recommend Sibley's system. Um, it, it, it just reduces a lot of confusion. And, but you're going to be in a very anatomical, controlled way charting this out. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's some work up front, but then the next time a bird pops up in front of you, you'll be looking at its head and be like, oh, look at your ear patch. Oh, look at your ear patch. <laughs> you got such an ear patch, right? And it'll just completely change the conversation that you have with the bird, and that will also be reflected on your page. And then there's the rest of the body, right? Yeah. But, but you really want to spend some time with that head, because once that bird is really looking back at you, right? It's, if you get that face and that head and that area around the eyes, right around there, if that's right, it's going to really feel like that bird. Um, you do have some wiggle room though. You can take like any gross, roughly bird shaped thing and you make the head red, the body yellow, the wings black and white, and people go like, oh, what a wonderful western tanager, All right? But um, there's so many other sort of subtleties of what makes that species that species, and it's all kind of like a lot of it's just coming out right there. So spending some time there, it's really going to pay huge dividends in your bird illustrations and drawings. But now what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time with the rest of the body, particularly with the wings and the feet. So we'll spend a, a couple little details about some other things, a little kind of note about the tail here. But let's, let's get started with that. So again, I want to refer people to last month's class for how do you kind of block in the shape of the bird, fast, quick lines to kind of get the oomph of this thing. But once you've got that, you've got a framework to draw the rest of your bird over. We spent a lot of time with the head. You're going to find that your heads, the lines that you then can choose to put in, you're going to be making more deliberate choices because of your anatomical understanding of what you're going to show in your kind of the few lines to represent the structure of the head. On the tail here, 
Um, what people will often do when they're drawing a bird tail is if here's my bird, um, they will have this tail kind of flip around from this point right back here. But the tail doesn't articulate here. So if this bird wags its tail, it's not doing this. The articulation point of this tail is actually back in here. So what's going to happen is this. The tail down, you kind of even get a little bit of a hunch in the back here. The tail can, from this point, even come up more steeply. But you'll see that there is a zone of feathers, there's a cone of feathers, half above and below the tail. And these are the upper tail coverts. And the under, oh, that abbreviation helped. The upper tail coverts and the under tail coverts. Okay, so maybe don't abbreviate those. Um, the, uh, so upper tail and under tail coverts, that makes this cone that moves around with that tail. So, see that little cone? That's articulating from back in here. Here again. See the nice upper tail and under tail coverts? So, what you'll regularly see on a bird body is that the tail is going to insert into the body, that's going to meet the breast feathers of the body, which are often kind of shaggy, making a really neat angle down here. That's how you attach your tail. onto your bird. And that's all the attention I'm going to give the tails now. There's a little bit more we could say about them. Um, but a lot of that has to do when you get really into drawing a more detailed picture. Basically, just don't draw your tail upside down. That's bad. Um, but I want to spend some time on bird wings. All right. um, this is this is I got to warn you. This is going to get fussy. Okay, we're going to really go down an anal retentive rabbit hole. Um, if you have a leaning towards kind of obsessive compulsive like me, like that, I really kind of enjoy getting into these little nuances and things. Um, but if not, just bear with us, but realize that this is another place that a little bit of work up front, understanding the structure of the wing, is going to have huge payouts in all of your bird drawings. So here we go. Bird wing, we're going to initially divide it into two sections. Out towards the tip is this triangle called the primary feathers, and then there's a block of secondary feathers in closer to the body. This point between them is the wrist. It's got an elbow down in here and a shoulder in there. So there's my secondaries and my primaries. And what are these? Primaries, secondaries, primaries, secondaries. Excellent. Notice now that there is a block of feathers that is over the front edge of the wing, covering up the front of the primaries and the front of the secondaries. Also notice that most of that is over the secondaries, and the part over the primaries is smaller. These feathers are called covert feathers. The ones over the secondaries are secondary coverts. The ones over the primaries are primary coverts. They're both on the top and the bottom of the wing. So in this, from my wrist, Everything out this way are what? Primaries. And this way? Secondaries. Right, so here's this triangle of primaries. Here's a block of secondaries. Do you see the covert feathers? Yes. Right. Now, um, notice the covert feathers also have several rows. These secondary coverts, there's some big ones, some medium ones, and then some small ones up here. 
the primaries are in here. And I also want to point out this special little pad of feathers right, right here. This. Or this. It looks like one more row of primary coverts, but it's not. It's actually a special pad of feathers attached to the bird's thumb. Hmm. These are called the allula. So the allula are these special thumb feathers, and these boop, get deployed at, in high performance flight maneuvers and slow speeds to improve the way that air flows over um, a bird's wing, much the way that flaps improve airflow over an airplane's wing. I always try to get a, a seat near the, uh, the window that looks out at the wing. Um, and Because I'm just fascinated watching what the flaps do as the plane is taking off and landing. You just kind of watch this sort of flap show. Um, these get deployed at those same sorts of high performance flight times. Um, so... Is there a number to that? Oh, Jack. Is what? it always five feathers, or is it? That's a really good question. I don't know. Question. Uh, uh, Lena just asked, "Are there always five feathers there?" I, I do not know. That would be a, a good thing to look at. And if anybody watching this on the video, you know the answer, so put that into the comments yes. below. When that wing folds up, what happens <coughs> is the secondary feathers make a block on top of the wedge of primary feathers. So the very simplified bird, folded up bird wing is that. There's an arc of um, of the covert feathers up here, the secondary covert feathers. On a folded up wing, it's really hard to see the primary coverts. Um, they are so small and they get covered up. But look at this, I'm gonna come up the front edge of the wing and I get to this little pad of gray feathers right there. Those are, my that's all I see of the primary coverts. So usually when people talk about the coverts, they mean the secondary coverts. Right. Um, people just completely ignore. If you draw all your birds and you never draw in primary coverts, no one will know. Except for a few birdery, birder people, right? Um, then you go up a little bit further and you get to the allula. So this dark feather right here, that is the allula. So two ways of finding the allula. Um, you go up the wing, past the primary coverts, and it's right there. Or you could go in along the secondary coverts, and often it's right in line with those, just kind of looking like one more um, secondary covert that somehow didn't get the memo on the dress code. <laughs> right? So, the relative sizes of the primaries and secondaries are going to be different on different birds. So look at this. This is, this is secondaries. <coughs> And that's primaries. So on long, on fast flying birds, they're going to have lots of primaries. So you see that on peregrine falcons, hummingbirds, swifts, swallows. Compare that with this guy. So, different size, oh yeah, that's nice. Do the coverts have a function like keeping the water up the underneath? Um, so they, they help with insulation, they help with water runoff. They also, if I have a side view of the wing, here's the blade of the, the feather going back, the bone is up in here, and they are going to create a thickening up here, making the wing go from thick to thin, oh, let's put <laughs> initials, from thick to thin, <laughs> um, <laughs> then, um, and if you get into sort of the dynamics of lift, um, this airfoil shape, the shape you find in an airplane wing, um, helps with creating lift. Um, so, 
And that's, that's also part of their, their job. And they're also used in display. So very often you see cool patterns on the bird's wing. A lot of that's going to be done by these secondary feathers here and those wing coverts. So on this bird wing, what we're going to do is we're going to go by it through it section by section. And we're going to try to think of, get ourselves to look at a wing and go, okay, there are the primaries, there are the secondaries, there are the, these sort of things. So we're going to start just by going up the front edge of the wing. So the primaries are this zone here. Small, big. Here we've got kind of a medium-sized set of primaries. The next zone up from that is if I'm going along the front edge of the wing. Primary coverts. Primary coverts. So purple primary coverts here. And what is above that? Allula. All right. So primaries, primary coverts, allula. Can you take a look at these three zones here? Can you spot them in this photo? Yes. Yes. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. All right, so primaries, mm -hmm. primary coverts, allula. Again, the allula just didn't get the memo. Yeah. These are the secondaries. With secondary feathers, what you typically see is one, two, three feathers getting progressively larger and then a whole pile that's the same length. So think one, two, three, whole pile the same length. That is my, those are my, 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 my secondaries. All the rest of this stuff, that's all going to be the secondary coverts. So secondaries, secondary coverts. And the secondaries and the secondary coverts are going to be really important in making the patterns on the wing. Can you find the secondaries here? Look for one, two, three, whole pile the same length. Yes. yes. And can you see those rows of secondary coverts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Right. So big, medium, small row. Mm -hmm. Now this, when you look at this, there's kind of a weird thing going on here. Look at the primaries. Yeah, the orange edges. Yeah, what's up with that? Doesn't it look like there's like a set of, no, of other feathers that stops right here? Mm -hmm. right. This is a very confusing thing to people. So, so what some people will do is they'll say, these are the secondaries across here, and then these are the primaries sticking out from underneath them. So they will interpret this wing this way. Here are my secondaries, and here are primaries sticking out underneath them. All right? And I'm hearing some... So, so, rah, rah. That's right. So, rah, 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 rah. Right. But what is actually happening here is kind of interesting. And for this, we're going to uh, make use of Fish and Game's Forensics Laboratory. <laughs> so the Department of Fish and Game um, has a website that's free for everybody to use that you can use to identify feathers that you find. Wow. And they use this when they try to, if somebody, you know, kills a bird, and stuffs it and then sells this as a curio. Um, it's illegal to do this with migratory birds. People used to be shooting migratory birds all over the place and just stuffing them and putting them in hats. Right? So not just egrets, like, oh, Leslie Bunting, bang! Right? So people were going around with all these birds on their hats and bird populations were declined. Audubon Society, bless their heart. We love the Audubon Society! Um, we're, we're here, by the way, at home. We're, we're in an Audubon Society office, so that's why. We, we love our Audubon. Join your local Audubon Society. They're great. So they're still doing great conservation stuff, but they, they help pass these laws, international treaties and laws, to protect these migratory birds. And so it turns out that there's no real way, way to tell of, of like, oh, I found that feather versus I killed that bird to get that feather. So you're not allowed to take these things and use them in, uh, in, in, in crafts and curios and stuff that you're selling, stick them on your hats. Um, so you're actually not even allowed to, uh, without a special permit, to collect feathers um, and, 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 and bring them home with you. So sketch them out in the field, and then you can use the feather atlas to, to figure out what they are. Um, the game wardens are probably not going to go after every school teacher out there with a collection of feathers, although you can, that you can get, that, that that's why they have this thing here, or read this first, it's like feathers and the law, right? It's illegal to do that. 
right? They're really they're they're going to try to target people who are illegally killing birds, right? But to help them do that, um, we want to if you've got a feather collection, get it to be a permitted collection, say for an educational purpose or something like that. Um, but that's this great website, and you can type it. You can go to search and then type in the name of the bird, or uh, where, where they have um, when we want to uh, the, the identify a feather. You can just put in, you know, you'll, you make choices between things, and then it'll say, "Could it be one of these?" And you look through the picture, and you go, "That's my feather." And um, you get these. These are all primary feathers um, from a flycatcher. Wow. And they'll have charts of the primaries, the secondaries, the tail feathers from all these different birds. But just take a look at the shape of this feather. The feather, it's, I'm going to trace it on the board because it's a little bit hard to see uh, with the dark background. There's a little notch that comes in like that. A little margination. And so the feather, there is the shape of the feather. And along this edge right here, it has orange up into this point. So you can see the orange right there. See that orange mm -hmm. along the side, stopping here. Um, so when you put those together, when you put those together, that's what's making these little orange lines that come out and stop here. So those are all primary feathers going into their notch. And then the feather continues on without that orange edge. Cool. Jack, on that photo of the feathers laid out, which side goes toward the body and which side goes toward the This is the edge of the leading edge of the wing. This goes towards the body. So the more pointed it is, the closer it is to the wing tip. The broader it is, the further in. Mm -hmm. If you find a feather that is strongly asymmetrical, big side and little side, you're probably looking at a flight feather, wing feather. If you find one that is very symmetrical like that, you're probably looking at a tail feather. So by putting lights and darks in different parts of each of these feathers, each feather can have light and dark on it, you put those together, it makes a larger overall pattern. So on this, if I took one of these feathers here in these secondary coverts, and I put white on its tip, and put that across a whole bunch of them, I would make patterns across the wing. So a very common wing pattern that you see what we call wing bars. And those are the first two rows of secondary coverts being dipped in white. So you see wing bars, if you look at quickly with your binoculars, oh, it's got wing bars. Then the bird flies away, like where were those white bars on its wings? They're probably going to be right across those covert feathers. Sometimes the white also continues up the side. The white, by the way, wears off. Wow. The white doesn't have melanin in it, and melanin is a feather strengthener. And so when the bird arrives in breeding season with like the pre perfect, fresh, sexy plumage, it often has these little white, crisp edges. And by the end of breeding season, all those little edges have gotten rubbed off. You actually see this also in wintertime. The starlings will have these white speckles all over them. And by the time you get into breeding season, they're glossy, smooth, greenish, iridescent, blue, right? They didn't change their feathers those white tips just wore off because they didn't have melanin in them. They don't have the strengthener in them. And that's why you see a lot of birds, they'll have a fairly light colored wing, but the wing tip, think of, of a hawk flying over, those wing tips are all dark. Out on the part that's going to get the most abrasion, they've got strengthening chemicals in there, the melanin in there, to make the tips of it stronger. Isn't that kind of cool? So here we go. These little uh, white tips on these. It is, it's, and this makes really bold display. Another place you'll see these first three feathers, one, two, three on the secondaries, these are the big display feathers for the secondary feathers. You often have really big displays. Often you'll see the whole side of it will be lighter colored. 
and uh, so it'll have this what light edge along it. Um, so these three feathers, sometimes these, uh, they're, they're, they're so special, sometimes people refer to them as their own special name. Some people call these, the, the, they're, they're secondary feathers, these are just one, two, three of the first secondary feathers. Um, other people refer to these as the tertials. So you have primary, secondary, tertiary, tertials, tertial feathers. These would be your tertials, or terts, because we want to abbreviate everything, like tertials, two syllables would be too hard. Um, so, um, these tertials can have little white edges on them. Um, you can also get um, white edges on, as, uh, pale edges as we saw on that flycatcher feather. Right? You put those together, so wing bars and tertial edges that are paler, and you have patterns like this. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So, wing bars Tertials, edges, the button. Wing bars, tertials. Right. What's the blue, the bright red blue, almost about the, not the bottom of the tail, but the next up from the bottom of the tail? I'll put it down the one. What's down that one? That this? Mm -hmm. Those are the upper tail coverts. Right here would be the rump, and then the upper tail roots. And sometimes the wings separate, and you see the back right through those wings. Right. So think of this in terms of, you see how you start, once you kind of get this in your head, you'll see the same pattern on bird after bird after bird after bird. So if you kind of know what are the kind of common things that I'm going to look for. Like, or notice that like, very often, like this bottom edge here, I'm seeing... That is kind of making an even a nice crisp little white line. Let's mm -hmm. go back here. Look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these are similarities between all these birds. <coughs> Let's take a look at an another kind of a way of arranging these. So if, instead of those bars, I'm just going to put spots down at the side. But spot at the tip of these and then at the tip of these. And then... On one of my primary feathers, if I take at the base of the primary feather, not the whole thing, instead of having the strip along the side, I just made the base of it white. So then the rest of it would be my dark melanin. I can sometimes get, oh, here's, I'm going to put some little margination spots in, but I can get a little patch poking out from underneath my primary coverts there. So here I've got wing bars, I've got spots down here going to a line of spots there. Little margination spot. Voila! So you see the patterns that are on the bird's feathers. Right? You know, if you kind of look for these things, you'll see these sort of similar spots on similar birds. And then um, when you're kind of in the field trying to get at what is where, not just copying from a photograph, it's a lot easier if you've looked at some bird wings and kind of just and kind of you kind of just geek out with it like so which feathers are making that pattern mm -hmm. and bird pixel and seeing birds are great websites to kind of get some of those really sharp photographs where you can get that kind of information so these patterns that comes from the primaries having white at the bottom right that's what's making that and see that little spot there isn't that cool here are the secondaries with the white tips on them. Wow. One, two, three, and a whole pile the same length. Wow. One, two, three, whole pile the same length. Wow. Isn't that neat? Thank you, fishing game. Here's the female. You look at that and kind of like, oh, okay. I sort of, I see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a fun one. We're going to do this. This is just kind of like the puzzler. Imagine primary feathers that look like this. All right? So primary feathers where at the base of it, there is white sloping in on the web that you get to see. How would that envision in your head how that might look? It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of get, but that patch gets, and you can see in this laid out feathers, the patch gets taller and then shorter. 
All right. So, you know, at this point, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, twirling wings is pretty scary. All right. Okay, everybody, bring the good air in, bad air out, drop your shoulders, unclench your jaw. All right. We're now going to start to get into kind of simplifying the wing and how to draw this in the field without kind of having to, like, I'm going to, like, put in every little feather. All right. I used to put in every little feather, and my bird wings look like pine cones, right? And just like scale, 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 like all this little, right? That's actually not what I'm seeing. Um, I think the person who does the best job at kind of uh, simplifying the wings in the way that we actually see them in the field is David Sibley, all right? Add props to David Sibley out there. Um, he is a dynamite simplifier of complex patterns. But he's able to simplify things really well because he understands that anatomy inside and out so beautifully well. So um, let's, let's think about drawing this wing and simplifying it. First of all, the bird can hide part of the wing for you. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So um, the front edge of the wing can get covered up by breast <laughs> feathers. Right? So look on this bird. It's hiding the front edge of the wing. See that little arc there? And sometimes when it's really cold, they'll really hide the wing a lot. Right? So there's just some, some secondary coverts, secondary, some primary sticking out. I don't see anything else. Um, in some birds, they'll have white edges on their feathers. Um, other birds don't. So you often aren't seeing this zebra effect. So a good way of simplifying a bird wing, my kind of go-to approach, is my simplest bird wing is to go from this, and what if I see this, and then on the page, I put down that. So I just have the simple bird model. There's the step where the primaries are. I'm going to cover up this with breast feathers, cover up this with my scapular feathers. We'll talk about scapular feathers in a moment. They are going to be a patch of feathers that's going to occupy this space right up here. And they make a curve across the top edge of that one. Mm -hmm. So, um, if the bird has clear wing bars, I'll often put some arcs across the upper edge of the wing to help me kind of place where those go. And those tertial feathers, one, two, three, often make such distinctive patterns that I'm finding it very useful sometimes just to lightly block in their positions. But this, with the wing bar suggestion, those tertials, that is, that's a, this is actually a very advanced little wing. Um, this is my kind of fast field sketching go-to simplification of the bird wing. Um, and that wing can be, there's my wing on the other side. Um, that wing can be held parallel with the tail. Birds will also take those and droop them. Oh, there's my scapulars. Um, let, let's, well, let's, since the scapulars just showed up on the screen, let's talk about the scapulars. Um, so, this part back here, we are talking about feather tracks earlier. If you want to, you can consider this triangle of feathers on the bird's back as just one big solid unit. Um, very often, they've got the same color all the way across it. But if you want to take it a little bit further, it's the scapulars. And what the scapulars feathers are is the part right above the wing, kind of attaching here, there's a bunch of feathers that then plop out over the top of that wing. And they cover up that leading edge of the wing. Um, so on this little bird here, that has conveniently colored its feathers like an anatomical diagram, mm -hmm. you can see secondaries, primaries, primary coverts, secondaries, secondary coverts in a couple of rows here. And those are tucking up underneath a row of feathers right in here. See that? Yeah. These are my scapulars. 
And then this is my back feathers here. In this bird, they've got different colors. So my scapulars are gray, my back feathers are greenish. Very often you'll see them being the same color with very subtle difference between them, but you will see this bulge happening right in there. So going back to this guy with the scapulars, um, now let's look at, at moving this wing. The wings can be up here or they can droop. So line of the tail drooping down. They can also swing up and um, Oops, slightly overlap, or sometimes greatly overlap. <clears throat> so here is wings up. El Diablo. <laughs> By the way, just take a moment, look through that wing. Can you find the secondaries? No. Well, one, just below the torso, but that's about it. Secondaries, right here. One, two, three, all pile the same way. Covert feathers, big, medium, small. Allula, primary coverts, primaries. Let me erase these lines. Which actually leads me to the, oh, actually first, wings up, wings down, right? So you can have that wing in different positions, not always lined up on the side of the butt. Birds will have, do lots of very expressive displays with where they hold their wings. So if we don't pay attention to that, we're going to miss some really nice subtleties with what those birds do. Um, the um, homework piece number two. So one was that head diagram. Homework piece number two is to do a, a side or three-quarter view diagram of the anatomy of a bird and really get in there with the parts of the wing. A labeled drawing, so not just a drawing that shows these parts, but little lines going in saying this is this part, this is this part. So make yourself a very careful labeled drawing of the parts of a bird's wing. And again, you can find resources in field guides and stuff like that. Um, the, uh, so we, I've, I've given you two of the five homework assignments that you're going to have. So two careful label diagrams, one for head, one for body. Right. Um, the final thing that I want to look at is going to be feet. Before I do, are there any questions about wings and heads, the feather tracks that we've looked at so far? We're good? All right. You guys ready for feet? All right. So um, here's, here's the reason why feet give people trouble. Um, because there's some kind of knobby, scaly weirdness going on there. Um, People are like, oh no, what do I do? And so they're making a sketch of something, and they might be, have the whole sketch is sort of loosely handled, and, and then they get to the feet, and they go like, oh no. And so they start drawing the feet, and they get worried about it, and kind of freak themselves out about, i got to draw bird feet. And then so they slow down, and they start pressing more, and then they erase part of that, and they get fussy. And what happens is they get this one part of the bird with there's a whole bunch of pressure in detail, and that's the, because they're having trouble there. And then because there's a lot of detail and pressure there, in contrast, that's the first place that people look when they look at your drawing. Mm. But if you have a loosely handled sketch, have loosely handled feet. If you've got a sketch where you're detailing in all the little bits and bobs, then you can detail in all the little bits and bobs of the feet as well. However, um, just don't go berserk on the feet on a loose sketch. Otherwise, all that people will look at is those feet. Right? And so I'm going to show you some things that feet do and give you some ideas about how to simplify thinking about feet 
and how to take a little bit of the, the fear out of it. Okay? Um, if I were to look at bird feet from the top, imagine a bird landed on this screen with its feet and then flew away. They're going to have three toes in most birds. They're going to have three toes in the front and one toe in the back. All right, so here's my right foot and my left foot. These are its footprints. Now, at first, this is going to sound like, oh man, just a way too much anatomical detail. But each toe in that foot has a different number of long bones in it. Or, another way of thinking about it, it has a different number of joints. So, the one in the back, there is one bone, one solid bone, that then attaches to a, a little nail. There's one solid bone in the back. We're now going to go from the inside out. The next one to the inside has two bones. The one in the middle has three bones. Mm -hmm. The one on the outside has four bones. So, um, what are the implications of this? Well, let's think about that back toe, and then there's a, there's a claw attached to each one of these. Claw, 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 claw. So one bone and a claw, two bones and a claw, one, two, three bones and a claw, four bones and a claw. That means that when this bird, if, say we're looking at this from the back, puts its foot around a branch, which one of these is it going to do? One of these is a bird with a broken toe. See that? So there's one with a spaghetti noodle wrapping around the branch? No. Alright, so no more broken toes. Um, Bird toes don't do that. That back one is going to be straight. It can articulate from here, and the claw can move and hook in. So the claw can move back and forth. But it's not going to be bending that back toe. As you go from inside out, the toes get increasingly spaghetti-like. But very often people take all those toes and just sort of bend them around the branch, like a garden hose. Um, but they're, they're not, they're, they, 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 especially the inside ones, they can, they're a little bit angular. You've got one joint in the middle where it's going to go up and then bend, bend down. So when you look at real bird feet, you're not going to be able to count how many little joints are there. I'll show you some photographs. I'm going to challenge anybody to say, well, this one has one, that has two. Yep, you can see that has three there here, and that one has four. You're not going to be able to see that. But you probably will be able to see that the back one is straight. The inside one is a little bit more angular, and then the rest of them can be kind of more garden hosey. Um, so here's how I might approach drawing a, a bird foot. My bird, I lightly sketch in a foot coming down to a circle. Right? The circle is going to kind of help me have like the ball of that bird's foot. It's going to be like a massive toes there. And then to kind of refine this, my leg's going to come down, and I'm going to expand it into a little bit of a cone, kind of a landing pad at the top of that bird foot. And from there, that's going to be the place that the toes are going to be coming out of. So if I'm looking at it from the back, I'm going to have that back toe straight. And then the front toes, uh, if, if it's, a, if it's a, a really wide branch that's this big, I don't have to draw the front toes. So if you don't want to draw front toes, make wider branches, <laughs> right? Uh, but let's say I want to put it on a more slender branch. I don't have to have a death grip with those toes grasping onto it. Birds are so light that very often all they need is to kind of get a little bit of friction. And that foot with a kind of a loose grip can hang on. When they sleep, they do a really cool thing. Um, each toe is attached to tendons. Actually, if you place your own, your own forearm on your knee so it's relaxed, and you press on your wrist here, you'll see it kind of curls your fingers. It can be kind of creepy to have your fingers moving 
without you intentionally doing it with his hand. So you press here and these curl a little bit. That's because there's a tendon that runs back this way. On the birds, that going from these toes out here, that tendon runs all the way back behind its heel. So that when the bird puts its feet on a branch and then rocks its, body, its legs down, sits down over those legs so they all fold up, it closes those toes more tightly so that it can fall asleep and not fall off the branch. Isn't that cool? And then straighten those legs out, you can open those toes and fly. Let's take a look at how to draw the foot from a different angle. Again, I'm going to start with that basic circle, the ball for the foot, and the direction that the, the leg goes into it. The, the foot does not have to, um, to, to meet the branch on the top of the branch. Birds are so light that they can, they can grasp it from the side. So sometimes you'll see the, the foot coming in from more of a side angle. This again is a back view. Um, you're seeing the, the, the lower toe, that back toe, as not bending around the branch. Um, it can hinge at the uh, point where it meets the foot and that claw can bend on the back, but it's not itself going to wrap around the branch. To fill in these feet, I don't recommend drawing in every scale. If you're at close enough distance that you can, you can see all that detail and the rest of your drawing is that hyper detailed, go ahead. But generally, it's a lot easier just to make the foot dark. Most birds will have dark feet. And then place a few highlights on those feet. They'll feel, um, they'll feel shiny, they'll feel scaly. So a couple of places to, to look for spots for highlights. One would be right where the that claw on the back of the foot, right where that attaches um, to the toe. There are often, there's a sort of a broad scale that you'll see that goes across there. And also a part across um, the, the point where the leg bone comes down, the tarsus, um, um, comes down and connects to the toes. Um, those are a couple of really nice places to drop a few highlights in. That just gives a suggestion of detail rather than all, noodling in all the detail itself. Here are some examples of some other um, feet and toes. You'll see that without dropping in a lot of detail, um, you get a suggestion of detail by dropping in a few well-placed highlights. So something that I suggest doing is going through a number of photographs and just looking at what the feet do. Um, you'll see here on this one, that top foot, the, the, the foot is more open. It's not in a tight grasp around that, that branch. The lower one is in an interesting common pose. See where those two lower toes are together. The top toe is separated in and up. You'll often see that on a branch. Let's just kind of go back here for a second. Take a look on that sketch in the middle of the, the page. You see there's that one toe that's up away from the others. You're going to see that in a number of places. Here, squint your eyes and look just at the locations of highlights. If your foot was dark, just a few highlights are going to pop that foot. Also notice that on the far side of the branch, you're seeing essentially one big toe sticking over the side there. So you don't have to draw in, you know that this bird has three toes. Um, you, can, uh, you don't have to draw everything that you know should be there and have that work. Let's notice here those two little scales right on the back of the, where, where the, the point where the claw on the back toe meets the rest of the toe. Those scales that go across there, that's a great place to put highlights. And also notice that that back toe itself does not bend around the branch, it remains straight. Even if you get to see the toes themselves, um, it doesn't really help you to you know, count in how many knuckles. On this bird where you can see its toes, um, count the knuckles. Um, Hmm, uh, hard to see, right? So um, I would say don't worry about it. But 
instead, a few little highlights, that's going to suggest the detail on your foot. Less is definitely more in this case. So just find yourself online, a bunch of photographs. Fill up a page with sketches of bird feet. And uh, well, actually what I'd suggest doing is, is both feet, showing the angle that they come in and how they hold on to the branch. And you'll get yourself, uh, your fear of feet will dissipate. Let's even take a look at that back one, that bottom one. That's not something that you kind of make up if you were thinking like, how is this foot supposed to look? That that one toe is foreshortened towards you. On the other side, you just see one hint of one claw on the other side of the branch. Can you get away with that? Well, this bird did. So uh, you can go ahead and do that. Now what I'd like to do is walk you through uh, step by step of how I drew this bird with watercolor and suggested detail in its feet, its head, and its wing without taking, getting lost in the detail and taking forever. Notice on the wing you've got a, those, there's those pale edges of the primary feathers. You can see some scaling on the foot. How am I going to handle painting this, drawing this, without getting lost in feather, feather, feather detail? and the scaliness of the foot. Most of my sketches start with a very, very light ghost drawing here. I'm blocking in the shape of this bird. Um, and I am mostly concerned with the proportions. How big is that head relative to the rest of the body? And how long is that tail? How big is that wing going to be in, in proportion to the rest of the body? I'm not worried about any um, focused details. I just want to get down those essentials. Also notice that the little faint line right down the middle of the face, the center line of the face down onto the chest, that's going to be very helpful for me to me in aligning the parts of this bird. On top of that, I'm going to start to put in um, details. And here, observe the way I'm really calling out the major feather tracks, and I'm thinking anatomically here. Think back to the feather tracks on the head, those parts of the wings. You can see the secondaries, the primaries, the primary coverts, the allula, those secondary coverts. Those um, parts of the wing, the scapular feathers, the ear patch, kind of walk yourself through it and you'll see that I'm laying in anatomically those parts of the bird. Now I block in a shadow. I like to do my shadows first rather than as an afterthought at the end. If I put them at the end, they will blur and mess up a lot of other sorts of details. But if at the start, I think of if the light's coming from this direction, where would the shadow fall? I can block those in without any other distractions and I'm not worried about um, destroying any other detail that I've laid in. Also, in the general plan of working from lighter to darker on a bird, often it, it, uh, this, this works into that sort of a plan. The back of this bird is going to be yellow and greenish. Because I'm using transparent watercolor, I can first put in a coat of yellow, and then on top of that, let it dry, and put in a coat of green. The green stays crisply in place and doesn't bleed out into the yellow because I let it dry between coats. And then dark. So notice I'm working from light to dark. And really being willing to punch in some saturated darks gives my uh, range of values much, much more depth. And that's where the bird starts to, um, to, to pop. The paint here was applied first uh, on that eye and underneath the throat, I was using a water brush and as the brush starts to run out of paint, a water brush instead of just drawing getting streaky, it just gets progressively paler. So as I go out along those stripes on the chest, you can see the brush is running out of paint. At the end, I took the tip of the brush, I fanned it with my fingers and with more of a a feathered chisel tip made those last few strokes that give you that kind of uh, hatched um, broken feather look. That was just with a, a tip of a water brush that I had fanned out with my fingertips. It holds that kind of flat chisel shape pretty well. Then I'm going to block in 
um, the gray of my legs and the, the wings. You can still see the um, those those pencil lines through where I was working in the the positions of the sort of the anatomical parts of the wing. I've I now know where to put in my my wing bars because they um, there's they're going to be on the edges of those secondary coverts. And then I get out a white colored pencil, and with a few strokes in about. 30 seconds, I have something that's looking really wingy. Um, I've noticed that the, the white lines on the primaries don't go all the way down to the primary tips. That's because of that little emargination notch in the wing on the um, side that is closer to the body. Um, that's the side that has the pale trim on it. You don't see that out on the, t the tip of those feathers. You can see one, two, three, whole pile the same length on the secondaries. And then on the secondary coverts, um, a very quick suggestion of, of detail. So with a few quick strokes, I get a lot of um, a lot of wing. Now with that white colored pencil, I'm going to add some texture. Let's just, let me just sort of toggle this on and off a few times. And you'll see you get a little bit of gloss on the back letting light strike it and a bit of cross hatching on the belly makes the belly appear fluffy and lastly look at the feet a few little highlights and you don't need a lot of detail in there but it gives you the suggestion that there's detail out there um, and that um, I think fine. I think that's that's faster, and that's it's a very effective way to be able to get yourself through that part of the drawing. So the final thing that I'm going to do here is take my dark pencil again. In this case, the whole dra drawing is done with a uh, Prismacolor sepia pencil. Though that's a brown pencil. It's a very dark brown pencil, almost black. And I'm going to push in a few details um, on the far side of the. Uh, one, two, three, those tertial feathers, those first three secondary feathers, the one, two, three, those are half light, half dark. And you'll see other places in the wings, a suggestion of detail. Notice a bit of crisp detail right around the face and the eye. I don't put detail everywhere. I put it right where I want somebody to look. I want people to focus their attention right there around that face and eye, drop in some detail around there, but don't spread it evenly over the entire picture or your drawing will have no real area of focus. So first, several layers of watercolor, letting them dry in between, pop in some detail with, uh, so with a white colored pencil, and then come in, crisp up a few of the lines, and add in some final detail with that dark pencil, and my bird is done. So this allowed me to cut through this picture fairly quickly and efficiently. Here is a drawing by the real, uh, one of the real modern masters of bird art. This is a, a sketch by David Sibley. I suggest that everybody go online and uh, take a look at his work. Just do a search for David Sibley bird art and notice the way that he simplifies feathers. In this drawing, you can see you know, ear patches, eye rings, scapular feathers, all those parts of the wing, but he doesn't get lost in noodling in every detail. He shows you the, the level of resolution that you'd see from our sort of standard bird-watching distance, and his drawings are absolutely exquisite. Um, again, the book... Um, uh, Birding Basics by David Sibley is the best way to get a handle on, uh, sort of become a master of, of bird anatomy. I suggest everybody get that. Uh, we got to support this guy. He's absolutely brilliant. And studying his work, here's another, I'm going to actually show you several David Sibleys, um, has helped my drawing immensely. I take his artwork, I study it, and say, what are you doing, David Sibley? Look at those feet. Look at those feet. Look at how simply those feet are done. And, um, and, and it really is, is effective. It's done in the same level of resolution and detail. Right. In this one, instead of, is, there's a few feathers, that, that one, two, three, the tertial feathers, you can get the sense of the gloss, the sheen on those, and then shadow takes over. Look at the simple feet. 
look at the simple wing. But by simple, that's not a pejorative term saying, oh, this is a simple drawing. I'm saying that he has boiled it down to the raw essentials based on a deep, deep understanding of that underlying anatomy. And that's what allows him to get through this drawing with just show a little that shows a lot because he's deliberate about where he's putting in that kind of uh, 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 that detail. You can spend your time, um, some really good time online studying his, his, his artwork. I really recommend that to everybody. Again, look at that wing there. All the anatomy, it's all in place. And, uh, but he's not noodling in every little aspect of that. Again, the feet. I mean, he's not even coloring inside the lines. Wow. And it works. So, um, yeah, you can tell I'm really impressed by his work. Um, find people online who inspire you. You do not make yourself less creative by copying their work. Copy them, study how they are doing it. There's a long tradition in artwork of improving our work by studying the masters. So you get to decide who you feel are the modern masters and check out what they're doing. Look at that eye, right? That eye is shown just by a highlight in the ocular ring and a highlight on the eye. Instead of drawing a line around the eye, you get the suggestion that it's there. That's absolutely masterful. When you see something like this that you like, don't just sit there and go, sigh, that's pretty. Ask yourself, okay, David, what are you doing? What is working here? What are you doing that is making this drawing effective? Boil it down into two or three key points that you can pack up with you and apply to your next drawing. The next time you're, drawing, you're doing a drawing, you're going to bring in that David Sibley eye and uh, your own um, sketching, your own artwork moves down the field. You can do this. It's a matter of practice. Put in those reps, put in the time, and you will find that uh, your bird drawings are going to get better and better and better. The single most powerful thing that you can do is just get yourself to draw a lot. The second most effective thing to help your bird drawings, I'd say understand that anatomy. And then back off. Don't show every bit of anatomy that you know and understand. Instead, suggest that anatomy. Draw, un you need to, to, to be able to understand more than you show. And your drawings will be increasingly effective. I hope that this, draw, that this workshop was helpful for you. Um, and uh, get out there, draw some birds, and have fun. Remember, it will come with practice. And don't be intimidated by birds and think, oh my gosh, they're just going to fly away. I can't draw them. It's actually because they can fly away that birds will tend to stick around more for you than other creatures like mammals who have to scamper and run and hide because they can't fly. Um, have some fun, and uh, I'll see you in the field. Bye-bye.